Hi everyone, welcome to another episode of Barking from the Rooftops. My name is Jim Gillis. Uh, just before we introduce today's guest, I'd like to thank everybody who's watched, liked and shared the podcast. It's greatly appreciated and I'm working hard to bring you the world's leading experts on animal behaviour. And the next guest absolutely falls into that category as one of the world's most recognised experts on animal behaviour. So let me introduce today's guest. Uh, Ken Ramirez is the ex Executive Vice President and Chief Training Officer for Karen Pryor Clicker Training, where he helps oversee the vision, development, implementation of training education programmes. Ken has nearly, is a nearly a 50-year veteran of animal care and training. He is a biologist and behaviourist who has worked with many zoological organisations and dog programmes throughout the world. He is a past president of the International Marine Animal Trainers Association and has been active in various leadership positions within that organisation for over 30 years. He has hosted two successful seasons of a TV series, Talk to the Animals. Ken authored the book, Animal Training, Successful Animal Management Through Positive Reinforcement in 1999, and most recently, The Eye of the Trainer in 2020. He taught a graduate course in animal training at Western Illinois University for 20 years. He currently teaches at Clicker Expo every year, offers hands-on courses and seminars at the Karen Pryor National Training Center, the ranch and teaches online courses through Karen Pryor Academy. So join me in welcoming Ken to the podcast. Hi, Ken. Hi, how are you, Jim? Thanks for inviting me. You're more than welcome and, and welcome to the show. And um, firstly, thank, thanks so much for doing this. It's very kind to, to spend the time with us, with us Ken. I, I know how busy you are, so, but, but maybe we could start with just a little bit of background on yourself, Ken, if you wouldn't mind. Sure. Uh, yeah, I, uh, you know, my my background is kind of interesting. I, I I came to what I do today from in a very circuitous fashion. I grew up on a ranch in uh, southern New Mexico in the United States, where I was around cattle and horses and sheep, and uh, uh, always had animals in my life. I don't know that at an early age I considered working with them or doing any kind of job surrounding them. Uh, they just were very fascinating to me. And as I grew up as a young child, my parents moved around a lot for a variety of different reasons and uh, moved away from the ranch where I was only, I only would visit once in a while. And um, that experience, uh, I think I, I began to miss that, that contact with animals. So as I was going through high school, I, uh, volunteered at a lot of organizations uh did some work uh some work volunteer work at a zoo and ultimately started volunteering at a guide dog organization where i first really was exposed to the wonders of training and i think the thing that really sparked my interest over the years was watching the way animals learned the idea of intelligent disobedience as a guide dog uh trainer you are required to be able to teach these dogs to, you know, follow cues and, and directions given by their handler 99.9% .9 of the time. But there's this really small percentage of the time when you want that dog to go, no, under these conditions, I will not do that. I will not walk you out in front of a car. I will not walk you into a a hole. I will not walk you under a low hanging sign. And they have to learn this concept that is referred to as intelligent disobedience. And I think for me, as a young high school student, seeing the dogs learn this fascinated me. I truly thought, well, this is an amazing thing. And I remember as a young kid thinking, wow, what cooler job is there than to get to play with animals all day, but teach them for this greater, more noble purpose. And so at that point in my life, I was thinking, I'm going to become a guide dog trainer. And I thought that's what I would want to do. And I stayed with this guide dog organization throughout my high school years as a volunteer, and then eventually ended up working for them uh, in this uh, apprentice kind of position. And I learned a lot about training because I got to a point where I was actually helping train the dogs. I didn't make any training decisions myself. I just handled the dogs and the professional trainer would say, hold the leash this way, say this, do this. And I kind of did it vicariously through another person. And that was really, really beneficial to me. And then when I got into college, I did a lot of different things, but I ended up taking a job, temporary job, I thought, at a zoological facility where I 
uh, got a chance to work and train a lot of different animals. And, um, and I think that the fascination and the realization that what I'd learned about training dogs at the guide dog school, and then what I saw happening when it came to uh, training exotic animals like tigers, uh, dolphins, uh, sea lions, uh, birds of prey, I began seeing these connections and became fascinated by that. And I sort of took off in the zoological world and worked all over the world, gained a lot of experience with quite a few different species of animals. And as my career developed, I realized that what I had started working with guide dogs, I was approaching that with a very traditional approach to training. We used plenty of positive reinforcement, but we also used corrections and we used punishers and things like that. When I moved into the zoo world, we didn't. We didn't use punishers. We didn't correct behavior. We used positive reinforcement to gain the behaviors that we wanted. And in the early part of my career, I literally just assumed, oh, exotic animals, you use just positive reinforcement, but with domestic animals, you use you have to use punishment. And I didn't realize until, you know, I, I feel foolish thinking this way now, but I didn't realize until three years into my career, after I had worked with, you know, marine mammals and birds and, and terrestrial animals and, and a variety of different species, and I'd worked with some 20 different species, when I finally said, wait a minute, these same techniques work with every single species of animal that I'm working with, why wouldn't they work with dogs? And it was only then that I came to the realization that the techniques I had er learned early on, while very beneficial, I didn't get the complete picture and I didn't really understand that positive reinforcement could really be used in that way. I continued to work in the zoo world, but I began training my own dogs through positive reinforcement and then began to see and learn about people like Karen Pryor and others who were forging this path through down the road of teaching with positive reinforcement with dogs. And so that's sort of how all of those things came together. And uh, um, I've, I've had a very long career now as a consultant. I have come back to the dog training world and have done consulting with uh, guide dog schools again uh, many years later. So as a young, young learning student, I first started working in guide dogs and then as a consultant much later, I've come full circle and am now brought into organizations sometimes to help them transition to the use of positive reinforcement. Many guide dog schools are now using positive reinforcement um, almost exclusively or at least predominantly. And, and we've seen a real change in the guide dog community in recognizing what can be accomplished with positive reinforcement. And it's, it's interesting to me to see that because from having been in that arena 50 years ago and then coming back to it in the last 10 or 20 years, seeing what a great change there has been has really been remarkable. And I've sort of seen that change throughout the world. I see the dog training world moving toward positive reinforcement. I see the horse training world starting to move in that direction. Uh, so it's been very exciting. And 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 I've had a very good, the very good fortune to have been able to work in a lot of different disciplines in a lot of different places. So I've really been exposed to the good, the bad, and the ugly when it comes to training. But uh, I, I think that's made me a more understanding trainer. I'm far more tolerant and understanding of people who still use uh, aversive techniques because I understand where they're coming from and why they have felt the, ne the need to use those tools. I find myself being more patient and helping teach them to transition because I use those tools myself and understand that sometimes it takes a little while to recognize and implement new tools. And so I, I'm, I'm very patient with people who, who haven't made that transition yet. Sure. And, and I would love to come back to that point in a second, but where can people find out more about yourself, Ken? You've got your own website, is that right? And that's that. Can I, I, yeah, that's my, uh, my personal website. That is just an, a website that sort of, I keep track of, helps me put the new things that I've done and I keep track of a lot of things there. Uh, obviously you can also look at uh, Karen Pryor, uh, Pryor's website, clickertraining.com. It's where a lot of the uh, lectures that I do, uh, 
the uh, various programs that I'm involved in. You just put up on the screen the the ranch. Uh, that's where I am right now. I live here at the ranch. The ranch is also the Karen Pryor National Training Center. I teach a lot of courses here. They're week-long courses that are kind of immersive, lots of lecture, but lots of opportunities to go out and work with animals. And so those are all places where you can find out more. And of course, um, if you're really interested in what I do on a regular basis, people who can follow me on Instagram, for example, and I, I always am posting when I'm in, when I just finished a project in Africa, I post pictures from that. Or if I'm working on a, a new research project, I post about that. I post training tips all the time and people can often can follow me on Instagram. And that's a great way to, to be aware of the many things that I, that I'm doing. So. Fantastic. And uh, you must have many wonderful species at your ranch, uh, Ken. You have dogs too, am I right in saying? Yeah, I, I have my own personal dogs. Um, what I have found is that often through training, um, I find that when teaching people about training, I like them to work with the species of animal they've never worked with before. And because what it does is it it prevents their their ego from getting in the way and it prevents their prior knowledge about a species from sort of t t tripping them up as they learn. And so I find that if I have a dog trainer and I can have them learn to work with a goat or work with a miniature donkey or to work with an alpaca, what ends up happening is they approach it with a fresh perspective. Ultimately, the tools of training are the same no matter what species you work with. But I find that especially experienced trainers coming in and getting a chance to start from scratch with a species they've never worked with before helps them grasp basic concepts in a new way. Seeing them applied with another species can be really, really helpful. So while I have dogs here at the ranch, I often will use those dogs to demonstrate concepts. Many of the hands-on exercises that we do, we allow the students to do with our goats or with our donkeys or with our alpacas, because I think it really opens their mind to seeing training from a new perspective. Working with a new type of learner uh, helps them internalize the concepts in a new way, in a different way. So for me, that's a really important part of what we do at the ranch. Sure. And I would love to talk more about how maybe in culture we've treated dogs differently than we have other species. You kind of touched, touched on that with horses and, and dogs too. And, and I'd maybe love to, to sort of maybe come back, come back to that point. But you mentioned that all animals learn in a, in a universal way. Is that, is that fair to say, Ken? Oh, absolutely. It's one of those things that, that, took me a long time to come to that realization. You know, people often when you teach training, I find that there's a real barrier for people that if I'm, if I'm teaching uh, an elephant trainer, something about training elephants, but I only show them videos of dog training, it's hard to make the connection as to how it applies. The size of the animal is different. The things that they eat are different. The things that they need to learn are different. And so recognizing how the laws of learning are the same is hard for people to see. It's the same thing when teaching people. We learn the same way as any other creature, but we also have the added element of communication, which could help us teach better, but often complicates the issue even. And so it's being able to look past those species differences and recognize we all learn based on things that motivate us. And, and we all learn based on what 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 the consequences are of our actions and when when those consequences are are pleasant or are reinforcing we we do those behaviors again and when the consequences are aversive or punishing we tend not to do those behaviors again and as you begin to realize that those laws of learning apply to all animals when i taught my university course at west illinois university i used to tell the students whether you're teaching an earthworm or a university graduate they all learn the same way. And people often laugh at that, but it is true. Now, it doesn't mean that uh, certain species that have greater intelligence have a greater memory for remembering things, have a better ability to, to do more complex tasks. And there's all sorts of things that, that layer on to make training more complex or more difficult. But the reality is when you learn the laws of, of training, they're scientific laws that always apply. It's like learning about the laws of gravity. It doesn't matter what animal you are, you all are affected by gravity, but you're affected in it in different ways because of the species you are, whether you can fly or whether you run or if you're heavy or you're light. 
but the science is still the same. And when people understand that, they can become far better trainers. Sure. And you mentioned a, a key word, which I want to talk about anyway, which was animal intelligence. And, and I find it difficult not to anthropomorphize or reverse anthropomorphize um, under those conditions, Ken. And I can't think of anybody better to, to talk to us about, given your breadth of knowledge of, of species. And in dogs, we, we used to think, given the, I guess, the testing criteria for intelligence, which would be theory of mind, they can recognize that they're different from their environment and different from individuals in their environment. And it was traditionally the mirror test, am I right in saying, that we would use yeah. for self-awareness. Now, now, the dogs fail that, and we can come back to maybe the reason of why they fail it. But, but I believe that dolphins pass that. They can, they can yes, recognize they can. themselves. Are there any yeah. other species that pass that test in that way? Yeah, of? there are certain species of higher primates, uh, like chimpanzees, that have passed that test. Dolphins have passed that test. Uh, what's interesting is I, I also used to teach a course in Chicago at a university on animal intelligence. And so that's a whole different topic. So I, it's a topic that I can speak quite at length about. And what's interesting when you look at the study of animal intelligence is there was a really, there was a period of time in the history before the 1900s when science was very accepting of the fact that animals were intelligent. There was just no question in their mind that animals possessed intellectual abilities and were smart, could be smart. And then, of course, in the early 1900s was the 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 story that everybody knows about the horse in 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 Austria uh, that was named Hans and the newspaper columnist wrote a story about Hans and called him clever Hans and it it proved that what it showed was that this horse who appeared to be able to solve mathematical equations uh actually was solving them or answering the questions posed to him correctly because of his ability to pick up on subtle cues being given out by the people asking the question. And it wasn't that he was trained to do that. Total strangers could ask him a mathematical question and he would get it right. And what ended up happening is the scientific community felt duped over for a period of time and they shut the door on, on animal intelligence. And there was a long period of time when any time an animal did something that appeared to be intelligent, uh, it was labeled as probably demonstrating the clever Hans syndrome, that they were displaying something that they had picked up. And what I say to that is, to me, clever Hans was a really good example of a very intelligent horse. He wasn't intelligent in the sense that he was doing mathematical equations, but he was intelligent in his, intelligent in his ability to read the body language of people and interpret when he was supposed to stop stomping his hoof and telling them how many they were counting for. Um, as time has gone on, our study of animal intelligence has really blossomed and we are now much more willing to accept that animals possess, well, many animals possess great degrees of intelligence. But what had ended up happening over time is there were many different measures of intelligence that people would use. They would say, well, it's the ability to to, to have a formal type of language. And then suddenly it was discovered that honeybees have quite a, an intricate language system that enables them to communicate where pollen is located and they communicate that to others. And you can come in as a person, if you understand the honeybee dance, you can recreate a dance to actually give instructions to a honeybee yourself. And, and it's quite amazing. And you realize, oh my goodness, that's a type of communication. And every time science came up with a way to determine intelligence. There were things like uh, language, there was architecture, there was uh, deception, uh, there was caregiving ability. There was a, a laundry list of 40 or 50 different abilities. And every time you'd come up with something that was unique, that the people would say, this is a uniquely human trait. And I think the desire was to sh for, for, for people to say, humans are the most intelligent of animals and, 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 and these are why. There was always an animal that was able to do exactly what they were what they were talking about. And what you really began to realize is that intelligence, whatever we quantify intelligence as being, is a trait that different animals possess in differing degrees, depending on what they need to survive. And so when you look at a variety of abilities, you know, the fact that dolphins, for example, have developed and bats have developed this wonderful echolocation capability that allows them to navigate with sound is something they needed to survive in their world. 
we as humans don't have that ability. We we developed artificial ways of doing that, but we don't naturally have that ability. And what what it really shows you is that animals develop skills that they need to survive in their world. And uh, what you found through training is that we can train animals to do some of these incredibly intelligent seeming things. um, And they can truly understand the concept, but maybe they don't demonstrate it naturally because it isn't a skill that they really need. And so um, I think intelligence is sort of an artificial way of evaluating an animal. It's, It's like, evaluating an animal on its speed. You know, if we all just looked at speed, would we say, well, then cheetahs are the top animal in the world because they can move faster than any other animal. While for us, we think, well, why do we need that kind of speed? And 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 intelligence is just another one of those traits uh, uh, that is, uh, that, that really is something that we developed because we wanted to be able to give it this definition when realistically in the animal world, what you really look at is how does this animal survive? What does it need to thrive? And it develops whatever skills that it develops based on that. And I always, when I, I always bring it back to a human analogy. And and I think that any test that we design to test an animal's intelligence is biased by the very nature that we created it. It's going to be anthropocentric in some way because we are human and we look at things from a human perspective. But I I think, for example, of my own experiences of having grown up in the country, out in the middle of nowhere, nowhere near big cities, and later in life having lived in a big city. And if you were to take someone who's lived their entire life in the big city and take someone who's lived their entire life in the country and give them a test, they each would do really well on different kinds of tests. You know, for the city boy who has said, okay, I'm going to put you out here in the middle of the country and you need to find your own food, hunt for it, find it, do it on your own, you would probably starve because you just never developed that skill set. Doesn't mean you're stupid. You just never needed that skill set. Uh, on the other hand, you take the boy from the country and put him in the middle of the city and say, here's a subway map, find your way around the city, he might be very challenged at trying to figure out the way the subway system works, not because he's stupid, but because he never needed that skill. And that's what happens when you start developing tests for animals. You're you're developing it from a human perspective, but it's from your own perspective, and it isn't really a fair judgment of anything except what that animal has experienced previously. And so hard not to interject your own bias into that and our interpretation it, it, of, of intelligence. It absolutely, it absolutely is. Yeah. And, and um, the one that I wanted to relate it back to was the, the mirror test for, for dogs. And it's also really difficult for humans to appreciate the sensory modalities of, of these animals in terms of how they interpret information. And, right. and one, in, in my course, when I, when I was back doing my course, um, one of the topics was the mirror test for dogs and, and why they failed that. And it was, it doesn't smell of anything. It's just a reflection, right? It has no information for them to tell that that's, that's something right. different than me, right? Is, is, is that fair in terms of assessing yeah, that way? It, absolutely. It's, 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 it's asking for an ability that the dog just never had a need to, to develop. And, um, but yet you look at its ability to smell and it's an incredible thing that we can't even begin to match. And it just, again, shows you that each different creature develops different sets of skills because they're the things that are necessary for them to survive and thrive in their world. Yeah. And that's that's exactly what we were speaking about prior to us coming onto the stream, wasn't it, Ken, about the kind of ethological model, evolutionary way of looking at behavior in tandem with the kind of applied behavior analysis way of looking at the consequences of behavior. And I wonder if you could maybe just expand on on, on what we were speaking about, if you wouldn't mind. Yeah, it's, it's interesting because I have, I first approached learning about animal care from an ethological perspective. And so I always bring a lot of ethological points of view to the things that I think about. Now, as a trainer, certainly the science that I use most is the science of applied behavior analysis because I am looking at changing behavior. But my ethological background never goes away. And I'm always thinking about uh, what is it that this animal might do naturally and what is its what are innate behaviors and what is the what is the the genetics and the the, the background of this animal 
tell me about what it would be, be doing normally and how can I use that information to help me? And I, I don't really believe that very many of us in the training world are purely one science or the other. We may approach something from a behavior analytic perspective, but we are borrowing things from ethology. We're borrowing things from the science of animal medicine. We're borrowing things from the science of wildlife conservation. We borrow things from a lot of different perspectives. And then not only do we use those sciences to inform us about the decisions that we make, we also layer into it ethics. We layer into it local laws. We layer into it um, the uh, the need of interspecies uh, cohabitation and what those needs are. We enter into relationship building. And so there's lots of different factors that enter into every decision we make when it comes to being a trainer. And I think it's very rare for us to actually take a purely behavior analytic approach unless you're trying to design a scientific experiment that is just looking at one thing. Um, often when I describe a problem-solving approach to a behavior analyst, they will always say to me, Ash, Ken, you kind of take a ethological approach to problem solving. And I never really thought about that, but I do. I, I, I look at it from a very different perspective. And But I don't think any of us really look at anything that we do with a, a, that single filter of one thing. We can't help but bring in lots of sciences, lots of other factors into helping us make decisions on what we do. And it's what makes us a better animal care professional, a better animal care giver, a better animal care advocate, um, because we don't just think of, well, what are the what are the consequences and how does that affect behavior? Yes, that's a great question to ask. And when you're looking at a purely behavior, uh, looking at things from a purely analytic uh, behavior analysis approach, you can have that exercise. But when it comes to the real world of making real decisions about impacting animals, we have to think about their natural history. We have to think about the laws where we live. We have to think about our own personal ethics. We have to think about the relationship that we have with that animal. We have to think about uh, medical needs and what are the medical ramifications of whatever decision that we make. Um, we just, there's lots of things that enter into that decision making and very few decisions we make are made purely on just one criteria. It's using all of those sciences, all of those aspects that enter into us making the decisions that we make. Sure. And you mentioned a term earlier about kind of a holistic approach, which is a little bit of a, a loaded term for, for some people on that, that holistic side, but it's definitely a great way of, of, of looking at it. And I guess up until maybe a couple of decades ago, there was a kind of radical behaviorism of kind of Skinner, Tim Bergen, back in the days of, you know, give me controls of rewards and punishers in any species environment. I'll give you any behavior that that individual, and, and I'm paraphrasing Robert Sapolsky, if, if you know Dr. Sapolsky, uh, I'm taking this di directly from this is not my thoughts, this is his, which is fantastic. But, um, you know, he kind of come up with a butcher, baker, candlestick maker, an analogy of give me control uh -huh. of those reinforcers and punishers. But of course, it's a little bit of a flawed way of looking at the rest, everything else that goes goes beyond that in terms of their genetics and uh, their individual self. And and again, I'm taking that from the amazing Kim Brophy who came on and gave me such insight into these uh, additional factors. And and we kind of came up with, uh, on that podcast, that you know applied behavior analysis is very precise. You know, it's very micro analysis in terms of behavior, but, but we're able to take a step back and look at it from a macro analysis point of view and look at everything else influencing that behavior. Would you agree with that sentiment? Is that a fair way of looking at it? Absolutely. I, but I also, I think there's nothing wrong with, there isn't anything wrong with taking a purely ethological approach or a purely behavior anal an analytic approach to problem solving. When you are trying to solve a problem, we have an animal that's, that, that is sick, or you have an animal that has a behavioral problem that needs to be changed. There is benefit to, for a few moments, as you analyze it, saying, okay, let's just think about the consequences and figure out what might be motivating this behavior. Then you put that to the side. You say, let's take a different approach now. Let's look at it ethologically and look at what are the genetic factors and the natural history factors that might be affecting this. Then you put that aside and you ask yourself, you know what? There could be some medical undertones to why this behavior is happening. We should ask ourselves, if there's a health concern and, 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 and those things will impact those other decisions. But sometimes isolating 
a science or isolating a way of analyzing something to help give you some possible solutions is not a bad approach. What I think is a bad approach is to only looking at that one set of questions and not realizing the entire breadth of all the things that, that, that it encompasses. And so I do think that broader look at ethology, at uh, behavior analysis, at medicine, at all those things are important things to consider. And so I do believe that we, we, we benefit from taking a step back and looking at it in that macro approach, as you put it. Yeah, sure. And, and that was something that led quite nicely on to something I wanted to talk to you about, about, about genetics and environment of how the, the kind of nuanced relationship where neither are operating in isolation, both are um, interacting with each other to, to drive behavior. Again, is that, is that a fair way of looking at it? It is. And it's what's, what's important to me when you start thinking about things like the environment and the genetics of an animal, I think it's the reason that pushes you to thinking one way or another. Because in many cases, as a trainer, there's not much that I can currently do to affect the genetics of this animal. It's already there. Um, understanding those genetics is going to be helpful. But what I need to understand is what can I affect? Well, I have the ability to affect the environment. I can change the environment. And that might be a way to find a solution to whatever challenge that we're presented with. And so that's why I think it's those kinds of questions that cause us to lean one direction or another. But it is always wise to step back and remember that genetics is playing a factor in what this animal is doing past consequences is playing uh, is having an impact on what this animal is doing um the animal's social structure is having an impact on what this animal is doing its health is having an impact on what it's doing and so you factor all of these things in and the more things that you consider the more things that you recognize could be impacting it the better you are at problem solving and the more likely you are to make a a better decision for what's going to be in that animal's best interest so in summary, it's complex. <laughs> it is. It it's is. complex for sure. And, and I wanted to maybe talk about how we got into such a dark place with our dogs in particular in terms of of, of dog training. You met, you, you touched on it um, and briefly about the approach we took with dogs. And we seem to have moved away or, or certainly we're now going back to that. But um, the approach with dogs was very different, wasn't it, for, for many decades in terms of... Um, pernicious pseudoscience which kind of leaked out into the into the culture of how we we treated our dogs and um we are now getting getting back I, I, thankfully to 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 away from that um but how did we how did we get into such a dark place with dogs in the first place would you say uh, ken yeah, i think when you look historically at things it, it it just was a natural progression of things i think that uh as dogs became domesticated and we began using them in as not only as pets but they became sled dogs and they became working dogs and they became things of that nature i think what ended up happening is we there we lost sight somewhere in our history of the animals being uh a, a sentient being that that required some consideration and i think that there was a period of time, and, and it still exists today in some corners of the world, where a dog is looked at as property and as 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 something that you own, and it's something that you you need to keep working efficiently, and thus it really approached the problem of this very strict. Well, what are the consequences? If we punish this behavior, we can get rid of the unwanted behavior. If we reinforce this behavior, we can get the desired behavior, and those businesses that were doing that were successful. They found ways of applying those punishers and applying those reinforcers in the appropriate ways, and they got the behavior they were looking for. It was only later as people came and said, well, you got the behavior, but is that animal as happy as it could be? Could it live a longer life and work longer periods if you've approached training it differently? We saw aggression problems develop and we saw relationship problems develop and i think uh a a a kinder gentler more informed opinion about how to approach things like that suddenly took over and i believe that that more gentle more informed more caring approach 
Uh, and to a lot of people's surprise, not only did it make our relationship with our animals better, it ultimately actually improved a lot of their behavior. It ended up making um, solutions to behavioral problems easier to find. Um, and so I, I, I just think it's a natural evolution of our interactions with animals. And they, they've they changed over the years, you know, from a very, uh, we use the animals to meet our needs to f realizing that we share this planet with the animals and it's up to us to find a way to cooperatively live in that planet together and work together in that in a in a kinder gentler way and we were very fortunate to find that taking that approach actually has become in many in many areas more effective more efficient uh and of course it's better for the animals involved as well totally and, and there was that misconception that punishment was faster that didn't pause the reinforcement, but that's that's not always true, is it, Ken? It's not. It's not always true. Uh, it, it it really has to do with the timing of a, of 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 a, of a consequence as to what's going to make it fast and 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 the severity of it. If it's a severe punisher or a highly uh, reinforcing uh, reinforcer, both of those can can cause what is often referred to as is one trial learning. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you don't have to touch a hot stove more than once to realize it's painful and you don't want to do it again. But the same is true in reverse, that when you do something uh, something, and the reinforcer is potent and is powerful, you want to go back and do it again and again and again. And there are many, many examples in the real world of those one trial learning experiences, both for punishment and for reinforcement. I think the, the challenge has been that when people say that punishment is faster, that comes from the fact that we have centuries of learning how to use punishers effectively. Um, we grow up in a society, and it doesn't matter where in the world you live, our society is filled with parents and teachers and coaches and people that are so used to saying, no, stop, don't, quit. And we have become very good at our timing and very good at our application of punishers. And so when you're really good at them, they work fast. And it's true with reinforcers as well. But as a society, we haven't learned to use reinforcers as effectively. We haven't discovered how to find the appropriate reinforcers for, for a variety of individuals. But when we find them, we find that people who use positive reinforcement can be just as quick, just as effective at getting that getting those uh, desired behaviors when you're able to time it right and 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 put it all together the right way. Sure. And, and but punishment's not free, right? It may effectively reduce that if we put a label on it, the behavior issue. And I've still yet to come up with a better term for that. Maybe undesirable behavior, maybe a better term, but um, but it's not free, right? So it may reduce down that that particular issue. But the fallout from using punishment in that way, and I think it's worth maybe differentiating between user applied punishment and naturally occurring environmental aversives. Um right they occur out there right and quite, quite rightly so but from a user applied point of view that can come at a cost particularly if you work with a with a predator species right right yeah yeah it's very true and 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 i think that there are there is a lot of fallout from from the use of punishment there's a lot of baggage that comes with it but in many of the places where it has been used those consequences of the fallout we're, we're not measured, we're not easily seen. In other words, when I have a boss who, who, who manages through intimidation and through threatening and through threatening for you to lose your job, the fact that all of the employees who work for that boss are, are performing at such a high level gives the illusion that that style of management is really effective. What it doesn't measure is turnover rate. It doesn't measure ulcer ulcers in that in that in that population it doesn't measure a lot of the different things that are, that are happening and 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 those are the bigger pictures that often we don't see um and um and that's that's the real the real risk is that there are so many dangers to the use of punishment but yes there are natural occurring punishers that happen and re the realistically they affect our behavior and in many cases um um 
it's it's beneficial. It's a it's a it's a it's a good thing. If I live in a very cold, harsh environment, and I look out my window and I see snow, and I know that that ice and snow is associated with cold temperatures, that previous history is going to tell me, you know what? Before I go out, I'm going to put on a jacket. I'm going to put on my hat. I'm going to put on my my mittens, and I'm going to be warmer. And that natural occurring aversive has taught me to be better prepared for the world. And so I. I'm not suggesting that we should somehow get rid of those naturally occurring, uh, they, 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 they're in our world. And that's why we as trainers have to be aware of the effect of punishers because our animals are going to be affected by punishers, whether we apply them on purpose or not. And so it's important that we understand the use of them and understand uh, how they are affecting behavior. Uh, but we also have to understand how they impact us and 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 as a as a trainer if i purposely put a freezing frigid cold environment and it's clear to me that it was the trainer that this person that put that environment there it might affect my relationship with that individual because there was there was a there was an intention and a and a and a reason behind what they did that 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 really makes it a a, a detrimental to our relationship. I'm getting off on a tangent here and that's a, it's a, it's a silly direction to go in. And I, it's just my way of saying that punishers always will exist in the environment and, and we need to understand them and need to be aware of them, but it doesn't mean that we have to put them into play and in everything that we train and what we do. I, I, I think it really affects the relationship with the animals, but I don't know that we will ever get rid of people using punishers, even in abusive ways. <laughs> unless we can create a society that grows up in an environment where we are grow up with good reinforcers and grow up with positive reinforcement, I think without being exposed to it on a regular basis, it just seems that we are so often exposed to punishment and its use very early on in our lives. And, and unless we can change that, it's going to make it difficult for trainers. You have to relearn how to use positive reinforcement because it's not something that was natural in your life. Absolutely. And, and I guess that, that punishment would also be subjective to that particular individual, right? What we think might be punishing to, to an animal may, for some dogs, for some animals, not be particularly punishing. For others, it may be so traumatic that I guess it's subjective to them. It's also extremely reinforcing to, to, to the person, I guess, dishing out the punishment, right? Absolutely. That's, that's one of the reasons why it's so hard to get rid of punishment. If you apply a punisher effectively um, and it works, it's very reinforcing to the user. You know, it's when a when a coach or a boss yells or reprimands uh, an employee or a, a, an athlete, and they change their behavior and it becomes better. They say, "See, it worked." It, 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 they, they don't even have to. They don't even think about it. It just automatically because they saw results. They tend to go back to using it again, and so that's the the thing that we have to remember. We can be so critical of people who use punishment, but we have to recognize that when they use it, it gets reinforced, and so that's why they use it again. Sure, it makes perfect sense, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. for sure. So, so wonder if we can maybe um, move away from that topic a little bit and talk about some of the wonderful conservation projects. I know you're very passionate about conservation, uh, Ken. And you've worked on so many interesting projects from, from my research. I wonder if you could just take us through a couple, if you, if you wouldn't mind. Uh, sure. I, I I have worked on a lot of conservation projects. It was one of those things where opportunities presented themselves where I could potentially affect the lives of animals in the wild and help guide them to better food resources or guide them to safety or help protect them from, from risks. And... Um, realizing that this knowledge that I had gained in applied behavior analysis and my already background knowledge in ethology could combine together in this very effective way. One of the projects that I'm working on right now is an elephant project in Africa where elephants are migrating through a, an area of Africa where poacher protection was very weak and this particular large herd of elephants was losing 60 to 70 elephants every single year to poaching and someone asked the question asked me the question could this could this group of elephants be taught to migrate a different route a route that avoided poacher territory and in investigating it it seemed like a very doable thing you know and uh we could provide temporary water holes to move them in a new direction we could provide a 
put up a barrier that would prevent them from walking the route that they used to walk. And while everybody was skeptical that we would be successful at this, we are currently involved in this project. I mean, the we finished our fourth year of the project just recently. And in for four consecutive years, we have managed to take a herd of almost 400 elephants and reroute the entire herd a, away from poachers and into safer territory. And in that four years that we've done that, we have seen the first increase in the size of this population in more than three decades. The population has been declining steadily because of the fact that they were approaching poachers and getting getting uh, killed. And now we are seeing that population rise and we've been successful at using some basic positive reinforcement to guide the animals in an appropriate direction. And, and we're seeing a lot of success with that. We had a similar... I had a, did a similar project six, seven years ago uh, with uh, polar bears. Polar bears were venturing further and further south into Alaska, Canada, various Scandinavian countries, and were impacting uh, villages. Uh, dogs were being eaten, people were being attacked, and there was a desire for us to see if we could teach the polar bears to go elsewhere to find food. And again, we went into, we started this project in a small village in Alaska, tested the concept, then recreated it with five more villages the following year. And then we recreated it with another 12 villages the third year until eventually we had 47 towns and villages that were involved in this project. And in doing that, we had an, before we started the training project, we had an average of 315 polar bear incidents happen every single year in these in these villages. And after the implementation of this training project, we went from 315 incidents a year to four incidents wow. a year. A major, major change. And part of that was being very thoughtful in how we used applied behavior analysis to change the behavior of these polar bears. And these are wild ranging polar bears. And so um I've, there, I've had many projects like that. I did a project with chimpanzees in Sierra Leone, a project with bilbies in Australia. Uh, we, we've done a project with sea lions uh, here in the United States. We've done a lot of different projects. Some have been very successful, some marginally successful, and some we had we were not able to, to successfully achieve our, our goals. But again, it's using the knowledge of their natural behavior, which is part of ethology, and using our knowledge of behavior and the applied behavior analysis to apply this to these situations so that we could adjust and change behavior. And it's kind of an interesting thing because I've become I've become known as someone who does these kinds of projects. And I get called into a lot of unique situations where we we explore options. And you know, at, at the outset, it seems impossible. It was like, how are we going to change this free ranging natural behavior in a wild environment where we have very little control over the environment? But that's where having wildlife biologists combined with behavior analysts, combined with uh, species specialists, combined with uh, government agencies, all working together. And a big part of my job has become putting this team of people together, making sure we get input from all of the different players so that we can create a solution that will be in the benefit of the animals, that won't impact any other animals in a detrimental way, that won't impact society or cultures or people that live in those areas in a way that would be harmful. You have a lot of different factors that have to be put into making these kinds of decisions, but it's been something that I've been very happy with the, the success that we've had at at doing these projects. It's been fascinating projects to work on, very interesting and creative solutions that you have to then come up with, uh, Ken. It is a lot of it remote based because you don't necessarily want to habituate or acclimatize some of these species to human presence. Is, 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 that, is that right? Well, that's always a big part of it. It's, it's a, a type of training that we use is called remote training. It's remote in the sense that we may be affecting the consequences that these animals are facing, but things that we do do not appear to be coming from us. They're not the 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 we try to remove ourselves from a situation. We do not want an animal to become 
dependent on people, to habituate to people. We want them to make these decisions on their own. But clearly, every decision that an animal makes is often based on what's worked for them in the past, is based on what consequences, what, 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 when something's reinforcing, they, they tend to repeat it again. When something is punishing, they tend to avoid it or not do it again. And we take all of these things into account and put together a program that will change the behavior the appropriate way. The challenge, of course, is that if we're trying to change the behavior of a group of elephants or if we're trying to change the behavior of a group of polar bears, how do we make those changes in a way that won't impact any of the other species that live in that region? So we have to be very thoughtful. We have to usually do environmental impact statements to make sure that we're not going to negatively impact any other species of animal. And we have to find a way to do this in a way that doesn't make the animals aware that we are there or doesn't make them aware that we are the ones that are shaping this behavior. We want them to make these choices on their own because eventually we are going to be removing ourselves from this situation and we want them to continue to do this new behavior because they found that it worked for them. It was successful for them in achieving whatever they need to achieve. For the elephants, it's finding water, uh, sources of water at certain times of the year. For the polar bears, it was finding a, a, a better food resource for them. We have to find something that will motivate them to want to continue to do this behavior even when we're no longer a uh, pulling the strings, as so to speak, to change that behavior. So it's a it's a very thoughtful process. This elephant project that I'm involved in now, we began planning this in 2009. We wow. didn't get the permits to begin until 2017, and wow. then we actually began in 2018. And we uh, we are currently hoping to be finished with the project in 2027. Well, you look at 2009 to 2027, that is almost 20 years. That's 18 years that we've been working on this or will have been working on this project. Uh, it's not a quick, they're never quick solutions. There's lots of players involved, lots of entities involved, lots of, of bureaucratic red tape to get over. Uh, it isn't just something where you can walk out, pull out a training pouch and do a quick training session. It really requires a thoughtful approach to how it's going to affect every single person, every single animal in this particular environment. So it's a, it's a lot of complicated planning, that's for sure. Lots of potential obstacles um, to, to to progress on that one, I imagine. And actually, Teresa asked a good question in the in the comment section, which I'll just bring up, of how you managed to move the polar bears away away from the villages. Was that just redirecting them to uh, to another food source? Yeah, there were there were three different uh, approaches to the problem. Uh, first was educating the locals as to how to put their garbage out and what to do about dried meat that they were putting out. The same with some of those clearly obvious things that needed to change. Mm -hmm. Second, we needed to find a way to lure the animals toward natural food resources. We, we, we didn't want to just put food out for them. We needed to guide them toward natural resources that they would be able to find food on their own. And then we also did end up using aversive, uh, one aversive tool. The polar bears, the, the townspeople had already put in place um, uh, sentinels that would stand on watchtowers and they would shoot rifles at the animals, not to kill them or hurt them, but to scare them away. But they were very haphazard in their use of these rifles. And so the polar bears would get scared away and just come another direction and, and enter into the uh, um, village from a different direction. And so one of the things I said, if you're going to use scare tactics, you ought to be thoughtful about how you use them and don't just arbitrarily scare them, but associate that scaring with the smelling of human related things. So when they would smell, their nose would touch a tire, would touch a garbage can, would touch a fence post. That's when I told them to use their rifles at that precise moment to scare the animals away. So it was really a combination of the food, the scare tactics, and most importantly, the luring to a natural food source combined together that, that ultimately ended up making that program successful. Sounds fascinating. What, what's been the most, um, if we go back to that sort of intelligence um, segment we were talking about, what's been the most intelligent animal you've worked with, albeit I understand that we, we spoke about how that could be tricky to, to, to assess. From your own perspective, uh, Ken, in your opinion, what's been the most intelligent animal? You know, it's a great question, and I, I don't know how to answer it really because I find that different animals possess different kinds of, of intelligence. In other words, if, <clears throat> if I'm trying to train a really 
active behavior that requires a lot of physical prowess. Well, there's certain animals that are dexterous and physically adept that learn those skills very, 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 very quickly. And that could lead one to say, well, see, that's a very smart animal. Look at how fast he learned it. But a big part of the speed of acquisition of learning had to do with teaching it something that was within its skill set, that was within the range of what it was capable of doing. And so often we have to realize that when we have an animal that doesn't learn something, is it is it really a measure of their intelligence or is it more a measure of not understanding their capabilities, not having the training skills myself to actually achieve what I needed to achieve? I've often found that my first attempts at training something failed miserably, but 20 years later, I'm able to train those skills very, very quickly. It turns out it had nothing to do with the animal's intelligence. It had all to do with my own skill set and my own knowledge of how to acquire that behavior. And so for me, I've never found an animal that doesn't learn, can't learn quickly. You know, even animals that people often think of as not being particularly bright. I have trained, um, um, I've trained snakes. I've trained butterflies. I've trained a lot of animals that most people don't think of as being intelligent. But as long as I was training to do things that were natural to them, they could learn it really quickly once I figured out the right approach to attempting it. That's a, such a fantastic example, actually. And there has been a recent study, which I think um, expands on that just a fraction in dogs, where there was an experiment set up where they were measuring about a dog's ability to pick up a new cue. And, and funnily enough, Border Collies obliterated every other every other breed. I think it was Border Collie, Labrador, German Shepherd, Spaniel, is what, what you would expect. But interestingly, if we change the conditions of the experiment from learning a cue to detecting a scent, then the Basset Hounds and the Beagles and, and your scent hounds obliterated the Border Collies and your German Shepherds. So I guess it relates back to that point about sensory modalities or interpret our interpretation of intelligence. What's been the most enjoyable, Ken? That's maybe a better way to frame it. What's been your most enjoyable animal to work with? Well, you know, what's interesting for me is the most enjoyable animal is often the animal that I'm working with at the time. Uh, and of course, there's no question that when you achieve success at that moment in time, it feels really good. It's really reinforcing. And so that makes it very enjoyable. I know that when I, I was working on a, uh, a cognitive counting project with a, uh, a dog that we rescued from a shelter many years ago, um, that counting project not only was something that this dog seemed to really enjoy, it really seemed to enhance my relationship with this particular dog. And so the fact that we managed to teach the dog to do a quantity recognition project that had never been done with dogs before uh, just filled many boxes of relationship building with the dog, success in training, learning something about a species that we hadn't learned before that made that really enjoyable. But for example, right now, this project with the elephants where we're training them to, to move in a new direction and, and avoid poacher territory, the fact that that population of animals has grown for the first time in more than 30 years uh, is such a satisfying feeling that, that I find it to be a very big highlight of my career now because the project was so difficult, has been so difficult. We met with lots of, of risks and dangers. We were attacked by poachers. Five of us on the team were hospitalized and, 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 and almost didn't come out of it alive. It's hard for me to call it enjoyable, but certainly satisfying in the results that we've achieved have met, made that really, really good. And so when I think about the many projects I've done, it's usually, um, what makes it enjoyable for me is having built a really great relationship with an animal or having achieved something that hadn't been done before or having really helped an animal come through an illness or achieve some success that really benefited that animal or that species. Those things make them very satisfying to me and 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 make them feel worthwhile. And so that is is um is sort of how I gauge it. You know, it's hard to say this was the best one or this was the most enjoyable one. There have been many, many in my career that I could highlight as being special to me and important to me and successful. Um, and each has a special place in my heart for a variety of different reasons. Oh, sure. And, and I would love to hear about all of them. And, and I could talk to you all day, Ken. I appreciate we're coming up on our, and I know how, how busy you are. 
Um, and as I said, I could listen to you all day. And thank you so much for taking the time uh, to do this. If everybody in the chat could just show a bit of love to Ken, I'm sure they will anyway. You, you're a total legend for doing this, Ken. I really appreciate it. And, well, and Jim, I, 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 I was going to say, Jim, I just appreciate you inviting me to talk. I, it's, I enjoy having the conversations. It's surprising to me that the hour has whipped by as quickly as it has. It's a good sign for sure. And maybe we have a, a, another topic for another day. I did say we would run out of time before we run out of topics for sure. So I'll just say thank you very much and, um, and, and take care, Ken. Thank you very much, Jim. And thanks to all of your viewers for tuning in. Okay. Cheers, Ken. Okay, bye.